Hey, it's James from Marketing for Restaurants here, and welcome to episode 148 of Secret Sauce, the restaurant marketing podcast. Today's exciting episode is 10 examples of restaurant value engineering to increase your restaurant's profitability. Some restaurants are quiet, lose money, and the owner works 70 hours a week. Other restaurants are busy, profitable, and the owners work a few hours a day. What's the difference? They have a secret sauce. Join James from Marketing for Restaurants as he helps you come up with your recipe for restaurant success. Your secret sauce. Hey, hey, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good whatever it is in your time zone as you're listening to the podcast. Before we get into all of the crazy excitement that is restaurant value engineering, I've got a little favor to ask you. One of our goals in the company this year is to have our 500,000th download mm-hmm. of the Secret Source podcast. So, a small favor, if you think that you've gotten any value, if you think I've been a good little value engineer for you, then please give us a shout out on social media if you see the ads for it. Tell the restaurant down the street or maybe a couple of suburbs away. You might not want the restaurant next door listening to Secret Sauce, especially if our podcast is a key ingredient in the Secret Sauce for your restaurant. So, yes, tag a friend in a social media post or, you know, forward one of our emails or even just good old fashioned word of mouth. That would be much appreciated. This is part three of our restaurant value engineering series of podcasts. And I think, you know, it's really interesting because it dovetails quite nicely with menu engineering and it'll also sit side by side with our experience engineering podcast series when we do that. The first episode, we talked about restaurant value engineering, the the concept, because it is a fairly new concept. Having said that, I think that what we're really doing is we're putting some language around some of the practices that many successful restaurants use. So what I've been doing is I've been sort of putting them together, sort of codifying them. Now I'm going to give you some really clear examples so that you can go, ha, huh, we could do that. And we could potentially increase our revenue, much more importantly, increase the profit in your restaurant. Last episode, we talked about, it's a great example, I think, of taking something, fried chicken, adding something different to it. And KFC in Japan, they spent quite a lot of money on their marketing campaign, but it was very closely aligned with what it was that they were trying to do. And now they've built a a really strong tradition in Japan of Kentucky Fried Chicken for Christmas. Who to thunk it? The key thing with that, they've created some value where there was a gap in the marketplace. And I think that is super cool. Now, we're not going to be talking about national marketing campaigns today because the kind of restaurant that we love is the single location, maybe a couple of locations, the small restaurants, the mom and pop type restaurants. That's who we work for and that's what we're passionate about. And every one of these examples is going to fit in bang on with your restaurant. When we think about restaurant value engineering, we want to be thinking of a restaurant as a just-in-time manufacturing business employing a range of skills from often transient workforces with time and temperature sensitive inputs, delivering products to meet dynamic and changing customer demand. Our concept of restaurant value engineering then is around a whole of business approach to increasing the profitability by looking at the assets, goods and services of a business and the difference between the cost to produce them and the price they are sold for. So my number one tip, when we're talking to to our customers, the number one thing that I say to a lot of customers is put your prices up. This often comes around because of the fact that they haven't done any menu engineering, or if they have, they're using a cost plus methodology. They're saying, you know, we're going to add X amount to the value of each of the items. It's a blunt instrument when it's coming to restaurant value engineering and to just basically running a business. The price that you should be charging, you always want to be leaving a little bit of value on the table. You want the customer to think that they're getting good value. You don't want them to be thinking, oh, it's so expensive, but I have to buy it. You don't want it to be a grudge purchase. 
you want them to be thinking, wow, it cost a bit of money, but hey, it's an awesome experience. And I would put that when we went to Alinea. The first time we went there, the Australian dollar was a little bit higher than it is now. But the next morning, uh, woke up and my wife said, can we go back there tonight? And I thought, yeah, it was pretty epic and it was very expensive for us poor Aussies, but an amazing experience. So, from a value point of view, that's where you want to be. And far too many restaurants are not charging sufficiently to be profitable. So, the number one thing is you can put your prices up. It doesn't have to be across the board. Most of the time, the customers won't even notice, particularly if you're looking at concepts like, you know, just noticeable differences. So, if you haven't heard of that, go back and check out the menu engineering component because we do talk about pricing in that. And there's some interesting topics that you can think about, but in general, putting your prices up. Now, the second component is to sell your food. Too many times we see a restaurant that will have food that is completely amazing. And and I sometimes see this when I go and eat at our customers. You you read a description in the menu and you think, uh, oh, yeah, that, that seems seems okay. And then it comes out and it's like, wow, you can hear the angels singing as you're eating it. And you think this is completely amazing. But it comes as a shock because it's been so undersold in the restaurant. And and this means that it's very hard to extract the value out of it because if it was sold a little bit better, and I mean, you know, having your servers tell a good story about it, the way that it's described in social media, the way that you describe it on the menu, this is how mama used to make it. You know, make that appeal back to a comfort food, back to childhood, back to that innate happy time that we all have. We take organic brisket, slow cook it in our custom-built smoker for 18 hours. Now, just think about the effort that goes into it. That's obviously... Now, I'm starting to get a bit hungry and I'm thinking about, you know, mouth-watering meat. That description there is a lot better than what I've seen on many a restaurant menu with a product that quite easily fits that bill. I think there's a really big difference between chicken burger and... We take the juiciest organic chicken breasts, layer on top organic local beets, and put it in a warmed brioche bun. If you're not talking up the meals that you're creating, it's hard to get other people to do that. And if you're not talking it up, if you're not really selling the food, then it's hard for people to see the value in it. And if you do put the prices up, that's when you're likely to get that resistance. So, You might want to think about the way that you're describing it and the way that everyone is describing it. You should have a story that is consistent across social media, website, servers, menu. Everyone needs to be singing off the same songbook with that. Next, what we want to do is we want to look at the intellectual property so that you've got, you know, your intellectual property, your recipes and your skills. And, you know, I often talk about the mad knife skills that many of you have. And that's because I'm uh, frankly quite jealous because my knife skills are not mad. They're bad and they're dangerous to be around, quite frankly. So you could do cooking classes, which is a way of generating another income stream. You can do cooking videos, and YouTube is an incredibly powerful medium for that, as is Facebook. You could create a recipe book. This is more than just creating another income stream for your restaurant. And it's important that everyone sort of really understands this. And I've got two examples of people that we've worked with that'll give you the idea of why it is important to think about it, not as a separate income stream, but as a value add for your business. A a really great idea around restaurant value engineering. The first one is Duncan Robertson from Holy Thai Basil. Now, he has been a evangelist for Thai food for a very, very long time. His wife is Thai. He goes to Thailand fairly regularly, obviously not recently, but fairly regularly. And he's passionate about taking those traditional cooking techniques and the amazing spices and flavors that are front and center in Thai cooking and putting it out there for people to be able to do in their own kitchen. He's got a cookbook, which we've got, which my wife has cooked out of. And I've got to tell you, the food is really nice out of it. But one of the things that's really interesting is that Duncan will find people who have found him online. They've watched one of his videos or a series of his videos. And then what they want to do is they want to eat in his restaurant. They want to see what it's like when he cooks it. 
This puts him in a really a powerful position when it comes to value engineering because there's no substitute product. There's only one Duncan Robertson. And so if you want to eat his cooking, then you're going to holy basil tie. One of the things I'm super passionate about is the way that technology changes everything. I was going to say the average chef. Uh, I wouldn't insult Duncan and say that he's an, an average chef. He's an amazing chef. But there's lots of amazing chefs out there. Now, I would also say that I have been told by some of the people on the team that he's a very attractive man. Uh, that's the feedback that I've had from some of the support team. There's a couple of things going in his favour, but the really big thing is that he has got, so on his YouTube channel, I'm just having a look, he's got a recipe for a pineapple and coconut smoothie. It's a three minute, 36 second video. It's been, 78, it's been seen 78,000 times. That is quite a lot. He's got a recipe for pad thai, which has been seen half a million times. Crispy fish with chili sauce. 438,000 times. A papaya salad, 214,000 times. These are big numbers. This is how you build a following there. And then when you build that following, people are obviously going to want to eat in your restaurant and there's only one of your restaurant. There is no competitor for it. That enables you to put just that little bit of extra pricing into your menu. That's pretty cool. YouTube provides the distribution channel. You've also got Facebook in there as well. You could even do it on LinkedIn. That would be an interesting little experiment. Big thing is, if you're creating the content, then you've got multiple distribution channels that you can run off. And I would argue, you know, I would use all three early on and just see how you go and work out where it's popular and then sort of test and adjust with that. A distribution channel in the old days, that meant that you needed to own a TV station. So, this is one thing that technology has given us. The other component, of, of course, is the actual production component, and you can use a smartphone to do that. Many people use smartphones. If you wanted to go berserk, you could get one of those Gucci digital SLRs that do video and put it, you know, buy a decent mic to go with it, and you are off to the races with the ability to create a great cooking skills or videos recipe channel that is going to drive people into your restaurant. Now, the other one that we talked about was a recipe book. I have in my hot little hand a book from Chef Adam Sobel, street vegan. He's the chef from Cinnamon Snail. Uh, we did a bit of work with him a while ago. So he is an amazing chef, super focused on getting more people to eat vegan food, partially because it's good for them, partially because it's good for the environment. But his thing is to make it because they want to, because it is just damn fine food. So you won't find any of those boring vegan meals in his restaurant. It's all epic stuff. I interviewed Adam a while ago. I'll include a link in the show notes. So you can have a listen to how it was that he came to write a book and get it published. It's not an easy thing to do, but I think it's a really big win. It's an added revenue stream for your business. But more than that, there'll be people who have bought the book because they were looking for a book on how to create great vegan food. When they're in New York, they would have been visiting his restaurant. Sadly, it closed in March 2020, they had problems with the lease on the restaurant that they were in, but I'm sure that Adam will bounce back with something uh, super exciting. He is uh, described as a thought leader in the vegan world, and I'm sure he's going to come up with something completely amazing. And I've also mentioned cooking classes in there. Now, cooking classes are an interesting value engineering component because of a couple of reasons. One, it's looking at the assets that you've got, and that would be your kitchen. And we will talk about that a little bit further down the track. It's also a really great way to build that community around your brand. Depending how many people that you are going to get into the classes, depending on how you want to run that part of the business... There's plenty of ways that you can skin that cat and make it a really powerful add-on to your brand. And those three things, so cooking classes, cooking videos, a cookbook, they're three different ways of building added value into the brand that you can then extract in the pricing that you've got for your restaurant. It also needs to be aligned though with your business strategy and you've got to make sure that it's aligned with your personal strategy. Some people love doing videos. My daughter loves doing videos. She's doing them all the time. Some people are really good at writing 
and some people love teaching. If you can marry something that uh, fits in with your personality, your vibe, uh, that can be really powerful. The next one I think is is pretty cool. And I've, I've just written it down as sell your secret sauce. Many restaurants will have, you know, they'll, they'll have that uh, the special burger sauce. Maybe it's a special curry. And it's definitely something that a lot of restaurants looked at uh, during the COVID crisis, where they would provide customers with the ability to cook the food themselves by shipping the ingredients to them. So if you've got a sauce that's really uh that really is quite unique and that people would like and i'm thinking some sort of super hot chili sauce uh like a beautiful naga chili sauce people can enjoy the burger as it comes out with the hot sauce on it and then at the counter as they're checking out would you like to take some of the sauce home Many restaurants view this as just another revenue stream, but no, what you're actually doing is you're offering them the opportunity to have the experience of having that super hot burger, because let's face it, it's going to be the the chili sauce that creates that super hot burger experience. They're going to be able to take that home with them. And so that little bit of the experience that they've created and then engineering a value proposition that is going to allow them to take that home with them. That can be really cool. When you think about this, when you go a little bit deeper, because I think that success is not about the answers that you find, it's about the questions that you ask. And too many people in their business don't ask the right questions. So where is it that your food is consumed? How is it consumed? Who prepares it? This creates all sorts of really interesting ideas that you could use. So let's just think about who who else does this. Krispy Kreme donuts. You can buy Krispy Kreme donuts at the airport. You can buy it at a gas station. Interesting. What they've done is they've looked at the the value that they've got in their business. And anyone who's been inside a Krispy Kreme, you can see it's an industrial factory conveyor belt, literally a conveyor belt of donuts, sweet, sweet donuts. And they continue to come off the line all the time. And so they can make a truckload of donuts, which is awesome many, many more than they are able to sell on a daily basis. So they increase their distribution channel by selling them to other people who want to leverage off the brand that Krispy Kreme has. So the two parts there of the the value engineering equation are the brand that they've got and the manufacturing capacity. Put those two together because, and those two are more than the geographic distribution that they've got from the store where the donuts are produced. So because of that, they sell them in other places, that distribution channel, significant revenue opportunity, profitability, great value engineering. This thinking is really at the heart of many a successful transaction that relates to takeout food. So where people aren't actually going to consume it in your restaurant, they're going to consume it in their house. I'm recording this on a Friday. If you're a regular listener, Friday's takeout night. Tonight's an exciting night, actually. We're not going to have Indian. We're going to try something different, and we're not really sure what it's going to be. So I always like these kind of uh, haggling sessions where we decide on which cuisine we're going to have, because it'll probably be a restaurant that we aren't overly familiar with. I'm keen to try someone a little new this time. But the product is very different to the dining service and we wouldn't consume a dining service tonight because we want to sit back, we want to relax after a big week. So think about the food that you create. What would there be that you could add in a sale or what is there that could be sold in a different location? Lots of things that you can do there. I think that's that that's a, a really cool idea. So we'll leave it there and we'll come back. Oh, hang on a sec. We've only done four Ooh, we've got lots to go. All right, I'm going to, we'll sneak in one of the small ones. Okay, so let's talk about prepaid bookings. I think that this is a really, really interesting concept. Many, many of the restaurants that I talk to are run off credit card. And that's because of the cash flow that they've got, that they really do need that advance to be able to pay for things like the the food that they're purchasing. Pre-selling your bookings works in a couple of really cool ways. This is traditionally seen in fine dining, but I think that there's probably an opportunity there to move into the mid-market, particularly as people have become increasingly accustomed to 
prepaying for their bookings. Prepaying is one of those things that most people don't want to do because what they want to do is they want to retain flexibility in the transaction. So uh, you want me to prepay to go out on a Saturday night. Well, what if something comes up and I don't want to and I can't make it and then I have to request a refund? What if you're not going to give me a refund? So one of the things that you have to do is you have to have an experience that people are willing to commit. If it's $100 to pre-book, then the commitment is more than the $100 because Normally, what they would do is come along, have a great experience, then pay the $100. Now, what you're asking them to do is to pay the $100. So, it's a way that your experience is marketed and the perceived value of it. So, it works really well when there's going to be a queue. works really well when you're likely to be turned away. Sorry, we can't fit you in. The other thing that you really need is some sort of fixed pricing. And it's interesting, in Melbourne, our hometown, there's been a couple of restaurants that have tried fixed pricing and they've struggled with it. I think really it's about the kind of buzz that they create. I think it's easier to build a restaurant business up, build the clientele, build the reputation, build that brand, and then move to fixed pricing rather than opening up with fixed pricing because people are committing to an experience that they don't really kind of understand. That There's not that word of mouth. There's not the, the PR buzz that you would expect. And so it can be a little bit difficult. And I think that that's why they've sort of struggled. But if you've got a really successful restaurant, fairly simple. And we've seen this with a couple of restaurants. Lume did that. They went to using Tok, created a lot of interest in the market, but great restaurant, a great chef. And they were able to continue on with pre-bookings. Now, obviously, when you make a pre-booking, that goes straight into your bank account a day, a week months before you're actually going to have to prepare the meal for them. Now, what if you're an average price point kind of restaurant that doesn't sell out every night? What if you don't have a prefix menu? All is not lost. And I think that the intermediate point between booking after the meal and pre-booking months in advance is gift certificates. Gift certificates are a really interesting little part of value engineering. It is the ability to give an experience, your great food, great value, great service. So it actually becomes a gift. It's the, it's the opportunity to give it to someone else. And it's pre-bought. That's amazing. They are a little hit and miss. Not many restaurants offer them. Some restaurants offer them and don't really sell a lot of them. Other restaurants do an amazing job. And once again, I think it comes around to the the kind of experience that you've built around your business and whether it's perceived as being worthwhile. Is it something that people would want to give as a gift to someone who was having a birthday or uh, you know some other special occasion? But definitely something to think about. So that's it. We've looked at the first five of our big 10 restaurant value engineering ideas. First thing, put those damn prices up. Uh, You are probably your own worst enemy when it comes to restaurant profitability. Look at the way that you're selling your food. Really increase the perceived value that it has. Uh, You know, make sure that you're using that description, trying to link it in with all of those things that you can do, which we discussed in menu engineering, but they're really important because it increases the amount that you can charge for exactly the same product. Look at the the skills that you've got within the kitchen. Think about things like cooking classes, cooking videos, even write a book with all of your great, amazing recipes in it. Look at selling your secret sauce or the other products. Look at where your products are consumed. And then lastly, prepaid bookings. If that's not going to fit in with the ambiance, the business, the uh, the whole feeling of your business, then have a think about gift cards. A little bit of financial engineering there to end off with. Uh, stay tuned. Next week, we'll be back with six through to 10. Uh, there might be a little bit more in there, in fact. And we'll go through those tips to increase your profitability this year. That's it. Bye. Want more customers for your restaurant, cafe or takeout? Every month, our marketing tools and information are used by thousands of restaurant owners just like you to help them find more customers and turn them into repeat customers. All of our tools and information is designed specifically for restaurant owners. We know you don't have a lot of time to spend marketing or learning complicated procedures, so our tools are quick and easy to use. If you're looking to increase your revenue and profits or want to work less hours, check out marketingforrestaurants.com